Well, good morning, good morning, and happy Friday to you. Yes, this is Stella with today's edition of Better Life. I am so excited today. And you know why? Because today is our gathering weekend. We've got people coming from all over the country. I'm excited. We've got friends who flew in from Portland. We've got friends coming in from South Alabama. We've got friends coming in from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. We've got friends coming in from Odessa, Missouri. Yes, and they're all coming here to Peyton Place. Yes, and we're going to have a two day, well, really three days of events. And I am ecstatic because this is something that I've wanted to do for a very long time. And I just felt, you know, probably if it was up to me, I would still be saying, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Well, God says, you ready, you ready. You, you just don't do what I told you. You ready. And so here it is. You know, God really orchestrated it. So this weekend, we've got an event here at Peyton Place called The Gathering. And we're going to spend two days exploring that scripture that says that we are seated in heavenly places with Christ. What does that look like? What does it mean for us in our time? And uh, so that's what that's what this weekend is going to be. So tonight we've got a, a worship session with some friends coming in and, and we're going to have potluck dinner and or, or as some people say blessed pot so we'll have dinner and then we're going to have worship after and then we'll have later tonight we'll have what's called conversations with heather rayner where we're going to really begin to ask questions about the courts of heaven we'll be able to ask uh, heather rayner for those of you who don't know is the publisher for ian clayton in many of his books, uh, most of his books, I believe, she has uh, published. And so she's going to be here with us. And she's, all, she's actually been here with us for um, the last two weeks because she's in between two conference events. So we're excited about that. Tomorrow, we will have three sessions. The first session is going to be with uh, Daniel Jedediah Cook from, from Gates of Zion Church in Mobile, Alabama. He's going to be here teaching about the Father Heart of God. And he's also going to be teaching and talking about how the Hebrew letters are really, um, they're almost like a love letter from God speaking to us, communicating the heart of the Father. Now, that's as best as I can describe it. I don't know if I nailed it or not, but anyway, we'll find out tomorrow. And then, yes, and then after that, we have John Graham, who was just uh, coming in from Moravian Falls uh, at a conference there, and he will be te he will be doing activations, uh, and it's a it's about ascension. Now, a lot of people have not learned about ascension, but if Jesus did it and Jesus talked about it, it is an invitation. All scripture is an invitation and a launching point for us to engage at a level that Jesus introduced. He introduces concepts as an invitation to us to do what he did, to live the way he lived so that we can achieve the results in our lives and the connection with our heavenly father that Jesus bore. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He also said, invited the apostles, he was saying to the apostles, look, I want you guys to be one like the Father and I are one. And so there were things that Jesus did that activated the oneness with God. So the scriptures talk about how Jesus said he only does what he sees the Father doing. And he says the things that he hears the Father saying. Now, if you're going to see what God is doing, and hear what God is saying. You have to be in his space. And so many people don't understand that the, the whole church age introduced the concept of heaven as if the only access you got to heaven was you had to die and go there. And that is a deception, and it is also a barrier that the church age placed between us and our Heavenly Father because Jesus went to heaven and ascended to heaven before he went to the cross. The apostles give examples. Paul, God spoke to Paul and told Paul to come up hither, come up higher. So we are all being invited as the church age door closes and the kingdom age door opens. Right now, both of these portals these gateways are open that's why there is such a heightened level of spiritual demonic and spiritual kingdom activity as well as demonic activity because the demonic realm tries to mirror what god is doing that's all say he just replicates what god is doing and so he is scared out of his freaking pants because he knows that the time his time is short and that as we identify who we are recognizing that we are kings 
We are priests. We are sons of God and we are the bride of Christ. All of these identities for those who are coming into this great awakening. They're coming into this great awareness. Good morning, Pam. Good morning, Beverly. You guys, come on. Go ahead and share this. This is going to be a good word this morning. Now, this is not what I'm, what I'm talking about now. It's not what I'm going to teach about today. But I just want to talk about what we're doing this weekend. Uh, it, it will be We will be streaming it from here, right here from Plate and Place. Yay! Yeah, we're going to be streaming. So there is a Zoom link that you can uh, if you'll go ahead and message me we'll let you share we'll share that zoom link with you so you can join us so we're excited we're excited so uh, and then after after uh, John Graham does uh, some teaching on ascension and some activations on ascension then we're going to go into later in the day tomorrow we'll go into the courts of heaven good morning Pam we'll go into uh, teaching about the courts of heaven now we've already begin to begun to see some significant results in people's lives because what happens in your family, what happens in your life, we think that what happens in our lives is about us. It's not just about you. God sees you and your family as a continuum. Okay? So what is on your family, the, the, the ties that are on your family, if there are generational, as we have described them in the past, curses, there are also generational blessings that we get to access and tap into. So with that insight, there are things that the enemy uses against us. He is the accuser of the brethren. He's Lucifer is the accuser. And so there, there are some things because of commitments made in past generations, those commitments, those, those uh, deceptions and lies, those connections with demonic realm, with the demonic realm, they are in many instances, they are still intact and they have to be broken. Okay, and they have to be broken with an awareness of your kingdom authority and your governmental position in the kingdom of God. And so you just a lot of people just try to go and say, I bind this and I bind that, but they don't have an awareness of what they are doing and the impact that it has. There are there are the, Satan is very much a legalist and he tries to hold people to the letter of the of the law. But God, he says, who him whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And so God wants to teach us to train us Galatians chapter 4 verses 1 talks about while a child is in his father's house he has tutors and governors to teach him so that he will eventually grow up to occupy the leadership role in that house as an heir and God is saying to the church today I want to grow you up train you and teach you so that you can occupy the leadership role I have established for you in the kingdom in my kingdom and so that's what this weekend, this gathering weekend at, here at Peyton Place is going to be all about. I'm excited. I'm so grateful that uh, that God is allowing us to, to, to do this, to launch this. And this is the first. This will be the first of many. And uh, we're, we're, into, we're expecting breakthrough. We're expecting the manifested power and presence of God, where God himself is going to begin to show and teach us specific things. He's going to teach us what he has been trying to get us to grow into. As, as, as they said in the old days at the church, you say, amen, amen. So that being said, that is this weekend. If you would like to come, if you're in the local area and you would like to come, if you will message me, we'll let you, uh, I think we, we probably have some room for a few more people, but we're excited. This is a private gathering. It's an intimate gathering. It's, a, it's an invitational gathering and we would love to have you. Okay. That being said, let's talk about our topic for today. Oh my goodness. So the other morning I woke up and God spoke to me. He gave me this word. He said, we must, he said, there are soul ties and there are scroll ties and you must distinguish the difference. Okay. So let's talk. So today we are talking about the difference between soul ties and scroll ties. It's soul, S-O-U-L, and scroll, S-C-R-O-L-L, -L, soul ties and scroll ties. Now, in order to understand what scroll ties and soul ties are, we need to understand some fundamental things about who you are and as, an, as your identity as a triune being. 
Now, God uses the triune model in multiple ways. For example, he is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That is an example of a triune identity. That, that there are three separate beings, but they're combined into one. And then Jesus talks about how he is one with the Father, the Holy Spirit. They're all one, but they're three separate. You and I are created after the same model. So to understand soul ties and scroll ties, you need to first understand understand how these three components of you come together and then how those components are actually interconnected with other people at different points and different junctures. So let's look at that. So as a triune being, just like there's the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, as a triune being, you are a spirit. Your spirit is housed in a soul and your, your spirit, I'm sorry, your spirit possesses a soul and then your spirit and your soul are housed in a body. To function in this earth realm, you require a body. That's why the Nephilim spirit, all of these demonic entities that are trying to make a reappearance on the earth right now, they want, they need a body. They are looking for, they are disembodied spirits. And to function in this earth realm, you have to have a body. So what God did was, in the, let's go to Colossians 1, verses 15 through 7, 17 says, Who is the invisible image of God, the firstborn of every creature? Or by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and isable, invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and by him all things consist. Now that phrase, by him all things consist, essentially means that everything that, that, that exist came out of God. Now, that includes you and I. Now, how does that look when you break that down with the concept of being a triune being? How does that come together? You are a spirit. That means your spirit man originated in God. In other words, God took a piece of himself out of himself and he, I, he, uh, he gave that piece of himself a soul, and then he allowed that soul to be placed in a human body. So you are a spirit, your spirit possesses a soul, and your soul and your spirit are housed in a body. Now, this is significant for us to understand when it comes to the difference between soul ties and scroll ties, because your scroll originated out of God when he took you out of himself and gave your, your spirit a, a soul and a body. See, your soul was created, but your spirit is eternal like God. Your body was your spirit, your soul and your spirit were placed in a physical body. And then at some point in the, in, in, in the annals of eternity, you were given the opportunity for your spirit to be and your, your soul to be placed in a body. And then you got to come into this earth. And we all did. So we all got to, we all had an invitation from God to come out of who he is and to come into this earth realm. Now, where does it Stella? Where is this in the scripture? Well, I'm glad you asked. Okay. So let's go to that passage because it says in him we what? Live. In him we move. And in him we have our being. Where does, where is that? Let's look that up. So in him we live. That's going to be Acts 17, verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. Now, that word being there means your existence. Your created existence came or exists in God. So he took a piece of himself. He assigned that piece of himself a soul, and then he gave that soul. Thank you, Pam, for putting that in the chat. Thank you. He, he placed that soul into a physical body. Now, why is this significant? Because your scroll originates at this point. 
but your soul, your soul, so your scroll ties. Now let's go where it says. Now David talks about uh, all the days. Psalms one thirty nine. Let's go there. So let's go to Psalms 139. So we're talking about the difference between soul ties and scroll ties. Now your scroll originates out of God when he even it pre-existed. Your scroll pre-existed your soul. Okay. So let's go on. Psalms 139. To the chief musician of Psalm of David. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. In fact, let me do this. Let me read this in the King James Version. I mean the New King James it says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts from afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying downs. You are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before, and you laid your hands upon me. And then Psalms 139 and 6, it says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go? Now, here's the beautiful part. David is saying, David is saying, where can I go from your spirit? In other words, he's saying, where can my spirit go and not be attached to your spirit? Now, remember, your scroll originates out of your spirit identity, which was a part of God that he took out himself and made it into you. Okay. If I ascend into heaven, now what we talk, what, why is this stuff critical? Because we are moving in the kingdom age, in the kingdom area. We are stepping into ascension living. This is a whole lifestyle of being connected with God in such a way that we get to live. We don't have to die to ascend and to go to heaven. We do what Jesus did. Jesus ascended. David ascended. You see, there are clues even in scripture that Joseph ascended. Now, how do we know? Because Joseph was able to access a technology that preserved an entire generation of humanity from a famine. Where did he get that? That's a whole nother topic. I'll teach that another day. Anywho, let's go back. So Psalms 139 and verse 8. If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. Psalms 139.9 says, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light around me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide me from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. So you hear David here giving an account, but here's the verse that is the clincher for it all. Psalms 139.13 for you formed my inward parts and you covered me in my mother's womb. So now David just outlined his connection, his spirit being connection in the first, the first 10 verses. He talks about the connection of his spirit with the spirit of God. But then his spirit was assigned a soul. And then that soul you see here in Psalms 139, the soul was the soul and the spirit were placed into a physical body. Psalms 139, you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my inward wounds. What was covered? His spirit and his soul were covered with a physical body because you must have a physical body to exist in the earth. He goes on to say in verse 139, 14, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, O God, and that my soul knows right well. So now you see in this whole chapter, I encourage you to go back and study 139, the whole chapter, because you see David differentiating between the spirit identity, the soul identity, and the body identity. Now your scroll existed when your spirit was God took that part of your spirit out of himself and placed it into a body. That's your soul pre your Scroll, S-C-R-O-L-L, -L, pre-existed your body. In other words, 
He goes on to say, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wroth in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance yet being unformed. Now here's the clincher. This is Psalms 139 verse 16. And this is where your scroll comes in. And in your book, they were written the days fashioned for me when as none of them when as yet there were none of them so now we see that your your scroll what was written of you and what god thought about you before your spirit man landed a soul and fell into a body so now that was written god wrote about that that's your scroll and so when you talk about soul ties, your, the, the soul ties don't happen until your soul and spirit land in a body and then you interconnect at a flesh level with another human being. Okay? So your scroll ties originate here. Psalms 139.16 is a model. You see this whole chapter identifying how your scroll pre-existed your soul and your body your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your books they were written the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them so before you were born he said I, you know before my body ever existed you already wrote about me now how do we know that let's go to jeremiah 29 11 because god talks about jeremiah 20 he talks about that so this is a very common scripture, but a lot of people don't understand how this concept introduces yet again, this whole piece. You have your triune, you are a spirit being, your spirit possesses a soul and you're housed in a body. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the thoughts that, um, the thoughts that I think towards you says the Lord thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. So now we see that what God is thinking, that thoughts that I think, think is present tense. So that means God is thinking about you and in his mind, he is getting, he has gained an inner image of what your life and my life can look like. Now that his, because he is God, he does, not, he does not take us and make us automated robots where we have this set future, this set destiny. We have to come into agreement with the scroll. We have to come into agreement with the connections that are necessary for us to fulfill the scroll. So now we see that there is a scroll that was written about you and I, all of us, every human being that lands in a body, even those aborted babies that are in heaven, they had a written scroll that God wanted to manifest in their life. There are things that should have happened because some of those babies should have been here that could not transpire because their days were cut short. They had assignments in the earth. They had roles to play. They had things to do. But because of the human will, human will, there are people who cut, or we've cut off those destinies. And there are things that were supposed to happen that could not happen. Why? Because God is not going to override our will. He gave us the capacity to make decisions and choices. So Jeremiah 29 and 12, then you shall call upon me. You shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. Verse 29, 13, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart and I will be found of you, says the Lord. Now God is talking about the significance, the way we are able to access what is on those scrolls. How do you get insight into it? You have to have a relationship with him because God is completely re relational and everything that transpires in this hour as we, as the church age closes and the kingdom age opens we have to come into alignment with it through di direct and divine relationship and connection with God so a lot of the stuff that used to happen and used to work as the church age closes is not going to work and it's not going to function anymore so people will be really operating out of their flesh or out of their emotions but they won't have a direct access they won't have they won't have the mind of God 
because in this era, you have to have the relational ties in order to know where God is doing. Because how do we know that's the case? Because Jesus said, I only do what I see my father doing and I only say what I hear my father saying. So that if you want to know what God is saying and what he needs you and I to do, we have to come into alignment with that. Now, what is, is an example? So now we've got it. We know the source of our scroll ties. We know that the scroll pre-existed the soul and the body. And so now we have an invitation to connect with that. How do we know? What is an example of how a soul tie, I mean a scroll tie, is actually overlapped with someone in a soul tie so that two people whose scrolls overlap have a divine purpose in the year. Let me say it again. What is an example? I love this is so good. What is an example of how two people whose scrolls overlap so that they can facilitate the purposes of God in the earth? There are some people who are supposed to connect. There are some people whose scrolls overlap and God has said, look, I put something on your books before the foundation of the earth that overlapped with something on their books. And the two of you are going to have to figure out how to freaking make things work so that you can step into your divine connection that was written before your soul and your body came into existence. Now, what is an example? Glad you asked. Let's go to the book of Ruth. Because here's a beautiful example of what that looks like, okay? In the book of Ruth, we see an example of how Naomi and Ruth were overlapped. Their scrolls overlapped. Why do we know that their scrolls overlapped and why it was significant for the two of them to sustain a relationship? Because Ruth was in the bloodline of Jesus. God needed Ruth because he knew there was something in her DNA that would facilitate the, 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 the bloodline of Jesus Christ himself. God introduced who was known as a heathen. She wasn't even a Hebrew. She was outside and it was a type and shadow of God introducing those who were outside of the church. It was long before Jesus ever came, but God was letting us know through the example of Ruth that 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 he is bring, he is making of one he made the gentile he brought a gentile a person outside of the hebrew bloodline into the bloodline because he was giving us an example and a model that he has he wants all man, humanity he wants all of us and so we see this example of ruth and naomi and so after naomi's sons die her she has two daughter-in-laws now it's interesting in Ruth, verse, Ruth chapter 1, verse 12, Naomi says, uh, she's talking to her daughter-in-laws. Naomi says, turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Naomi has decided she's going back to her homeland. Her sons has, have died. She has no one to care for her, no one to take care for them, to, 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 to provide for her. So she's going back to where she came from. Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have, an, have a husband. If I should say, I have hope, if I should also, if I should also have a husband also tonight and should bear sons, would you wait for them until they're grown? Would you say, say, stay for them from having a husband? No, my daughters, for it grieves me much for your sake that the hand of lo the Lord has gone against me. So Ruth is mourning the death of her sons. And so she has two daughter-in-laws, Orpha and Ruth. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave to her. Ruth stuck to her. In other words, that word clave implies a tie. Ruth stayed with Naomi. And then she speaks this decree. This is so powerful. Na uh, Ruth 1.16. And Ruth says, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For wherever thou goest, I will go, and wherever thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, but more also, if aught but death part me, part thee and me. So Ruth and Naomi had a soul tie bond 
that was necessary because God was introducing Ruth into the bloodline of Jesus. There are some people who are supposed to connect to you because your scrolls overlap. There was another example, okay? There was the example of David and Jonathan. David and Jonathan, you see in scriptures where it talks about their hearts were knit together. Now, some people try to take that and pervert it and to say as if David and Jonathan had a, a, a um, perverted relationship. I'll just leave it at that. But that's not what it was talking about. It was talking about how their scrolls overlapped because Jonathan was instrumental in protecting David from his father, Saul, his murderous father, who was intent upon killing killing David and multiple times Jonathan stood between David and his father and made sure that David God used Jonathan to keep David safe in the earlier days and then after Jonathan so that so that so that David's position to be to eventually become king of Israel was guarded in other words Jonathan stood between Saul and David and protected David their scrolls overlapped Okay. Now, there are many examples throughout scriptures and throughout life where people's scrolls overlap, where the, the effectiveness of one cannot, uh, would not happen without the other. Now, as I was researching this, I came upon something that fascinated me. And it was actually talking about a type of engine called a twin scroll. Now, this when I was reading this and I studied this this turbo twin scroll en engine, this this really stuck out, stood out to to really expand the concept is that when your scrolls overlap, there are some things that the two people are supposed to do. They need to come together to overcome all of the factors that the enemy would endeavor to use to separate them, to fight them, to keep them apart. That's why there are some people you can't, it's like you can't get them out your life. It's like, what? You know, I, have a, I have a very dear friend who actually married the same person three times. And the, but the enemy, and this is why the courts of heaven is so critical. If you don't understand what the enemy is using against you to keep you apart, you, your soul ties can be used against you to separate you from that person or to keep you locked into a frame of mind until your time runs out and you never have the opportunity to step into your assignment. That's why there has to be resolution between you and past people. Wherever you see a repeated pattern of interactions with people and it happens over and over and over again, you need to go back to the first time it happens and find out what door was open, what portal was open, and where the enemy has been granted access to your life through that soul tie and through that potential scroll tie. You got to find it out. We have to know. Now, as I was reading about this particular engine, it's called a twin scroll engine. It says the twin scroll design came about from turbo diesels, which have huge exhaust pulses and very low operating RPMs. This means lots of slow but forceful pulses of exhaust spooling up the turbo, keeping them separate, has proven to be beneficial in this way. On a smaller displacement, higher revving motors, the benefits are much less because you're dealing with smaller, faster exhaust pulses, which creates an almost linear pulse in the turbo wheel. The twin scroll turbos are spooling faster, but it is because of the volume of the turbo housing is less due to the divide being there. Now, what that says to me as I was reading that it kind of, it kind of exploded in my mind is that as long as these two these two sides of an engine are separated there is a limit but when the power of those two engines are able to the, those two uh, I think the word is manifolds when they come together it accelerates and it creates a turbo burst which is multiplied power 
that is an example of what happens when two scrolls overlap and two people can come into harmony and they have to come into agreement so that they can not only manifest a soul tie, but then they can then begin to manifest a scroll tie. That's why Satan hates marriage so much because if when two people marry, and this is something that Heather was saying the other night, just blew my mind. She says, when two people get married, God takes their two scrolls and they become one. That's why the scripture says, and the two shall become one flesh. So what happens is when two people get married, their scrolls overlap, their soul, their, their, their bodies overlap. But what many fail to do is they never allowed their souls to overlap. And so there's so much, there's a lot of conflict because they don't understand that you've got a spiritual connection on the scroll level and you've got a physical connection on the soul level, uh, on, the, on the flesh level. But the Lord is saying, look, in order for you to really step into your scroll, you're going to have to go back to where you originated. Now, where did did your spirit originated it originated out of God and that's what so now let's look at this word so that in order for the scroll and the soul to become tied so that you have scroll ties and soul ties we have to do what is called we have to work inside the soul and become partakers of what is called God's divine nature let's look at that Oh, this is so good. I don't know about y'all, but this is blessing me, okay? So let's look at that pat, that particular phrase, God's divine nature. So what we've covered so far is we said that you have scroll ties and you have soul ties. That your scroll ties, S-C-R-O-L-L, originate out of God. That God takes a piece of himself and he, he, he assigns that piece of himself a soul and then he places it in a body. We see that outlined by David in all of Psalms 139. David breaks down the three elements of his his, his triune identity. He breaks down the spirit. He talks about his spirit connection with God. Then he breaks down the soul. He talks about his soul connection with God. And then he talks about his body. He goes on to explain how his spirit, his soul were placed in a body. And he goes, God, you deep. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I got all three of these triune identities wrapped into me. Now, another powerful, and I didn't talk about this one a moment ago, but we saw, this was a friend of mine really brought this out, and it was so deep, I had never thought about it. There, when you look at David and Bathsheba, God, God knew that Solomon was coming, okay? But David, remember the scripture where it talks about in the spring when kings go to war? David did not go to war. David stayed home. So instead of being out on the battlefield where he was supposed to be, he was at home. He saw Bathsheba. He got into it. He has sex with Bathsheba, gets Uriah's wife pregnant, and then they have a baby. She gets pregnant, then the baby dies. David prays trying to you know, get God, and then God is like, no, nope, no. Nope. Now, a friend of mine said the other day, and I had never thought about this, he said, if David had gone to war where he was supposed to be, if he had been in the proper place, in the right position, more than like, it is possible that Uriah, who was a dedicated warrior, that Uriah would, could have also been killed on the battlefield, which means that he, David would have had to go back and take care of Uriah's wife, who was Bathsheba, which would still have placed him in the path of Bathsheba. But that pattern, that remember, we are we have multiple trajectories that we can go. Our lives, we our will creates these paths, these pathways. God. Mm, quoted this in Jeremiah 29 11 the words that word I know the thoughts that I think that word think implies in one of the meanings of that words is to plat p-l-a-t that's like when you take a little girl's hair and you plat it you have three distinct pieces well, one of the meaning of that word is that you plat it as God, God says, I am thinking. In other words, he says, I am weaving you into existence, but there are three pieces. What's the first piece? The first piece is your spirit, which originates with God. That's the first piece of the plat. The second piece of the plat is your will. That's you. That's your soul. Your soul. What is your soul? Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. So God has a plat, which is your spirit, but then your soul has a plat, which is you, but then 
then there's also the third part of that plat, which is Holy Spirit. When we come into agreement with Holy Spirit, God then can take all three of these dimensions and weave them together to create our, our purpose, our, our identity, and who and what we're supposed to be in the earth. Okay, so so without those three pieces, a lot of people are just wander around going, I don't know why I'm here, I don't know my purpose, Lord. Well, this is why. This explains it, okay? This explains why you don't know why you hurt. Okay, so back, back to it. So now we understand that that triune you, spirit, soul, and body, originated in God. And so now we go, we're gonna bring those three pieces, those soul, the scroll which was the scroll was written before the soul and the body existed. The scroll was written before the soul and the body existed. The scroll was drafted in the mind of God when he thought of you. And then he said, hmm, I'm going to give this piece of me the opportunity to come to the earth. I'm going to give them an invitation to come here and to manifest what I wrote on those books. And we get to do that. We get to partner with God so that we can do that. But here's the thing. God is so relational and everything he does, he does it as a model of how he wants us to connect with him. And in order for us to connect the scroll tie with the soul tie, and see a lot of people have, you, you can have great sex. You can have amazing sex. That is a tool that God says, you know, if I, if I put this man and this woman together and I give them this, this intense relationship, it, will be, it can be used to facilitate the unity of the two people so that they can get close enough in each other's space so that the, the physical tie can then strengthen. They, they will, they will, mm, this physical tie will give them access to the soul tie. That's the connection of the mind, what they're thinking thinking, the emotions, what they're feeling, and the will, the actions that they take. So God is saying, look, I got the, I got you down here in the flesh. Okay, you got that physical tie, but now I want you to tie yourselves in your mind, your will, and your emotions. I want you to bind those two together because you're going to need to be one mind. And then he says, so that in order, so that once you do that, as you're doing that, it will facilitate you coming into alignment to do what's on the scrolls. Now, you don't have to do, we don't have to do that. We can go our own way. We can have our own will. We can say, God, I don't want you. I reject you. I, I, I reject your plan. I reject your scroll. You have the will. Your will can do that. Okay. Now I wouldn't do it. I don't want to do it. I, I, I told the Lord the other day, I was like, God, I want to honor what's on my scrolls. And if there are people that need to be connected with that, I need to be connected with you need to show me and you need to give me clarity and you need to show me how do, how do, how do, how do we do this? What, what is the act? And this is where this key word comes in. It's called partakers. Partakers. Partakers of God's divine nature. Let's look at that word. Uh, let's see, where do I want to start? Because it's so rich. It's so rich. Give me one second. Because there are, there are three different passages that I want to touch on, but it's really important that I get them in the right order. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Here we go. Let's start with 2 Peter 1 and 4, okay? Uh Second Peter 1 and 4 says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now let's break that up because there are some critical pieces that we need to take into account, okay? exceedingly great and precious promises that means god has assured us he has given us certain rights and privileges that as we step into our identity that was written on the scrolls as we receive jesus we get to have access to those scrolls okay those are the promises that he's trying to give us access to. And we become partakers of those promises through the divine nature. That by these, by these what? By these promises, you might be partakers or you may take part. You may take that part 
of God's divine nature so that the soul can then begin so that when we are interconnecting with other people, our mind, our will and our emotions become under the influence of the divine nature of God. And that allows us to escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, when it comes to soul ties, soul ties are strong in the physical and so when th those ties are going to come from one of two directions. They're either going to come from God or they're going to come from the demonic realm. Satan wants you attached to people who can distract and deter you from, under from getting access to your scroll. So he will say, I'm going to function in the flesh to keep you focused on things that will separate you from the people you are really supposed to be with. I'm going to help, help you. I'm going to I'm going to introduce feelings and sensations and all of this. And, and I'm going to tell you all kinds of things. I'm going to tell you, oh, you know what you if God said he created the male and female, then what the first thing the enemy is going to do is he says, oh, no, you're not. You're not male. You're not female. Why? Because if he can convince you that there is any other form of human physiological identity, he will guarantee that if there are only two portals through which your identity can be assigned from the hip, from the scroll realm, from the realm of your pre-existence, God says he in Genesis, he says, I created the male and female. And so so what the enemy says, look, you're not male. No, 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 you're not. You're not that. Why? Because if he can separate you from those two identities, he can guarantee that you will never access what was written on your scroll. Because your identity is misaligned with the mind of God who thought of you, imagined you, took a piece of himself, get, took that spirit piece of himself and assigned it a soul. And so what the enemy says is, I want to misalign the soul and prevent it from ever accessing what was written on the scroll. And so here you are, a spirit being, wandering around on the earth, confused, misdirected. Now, you can't get mad at me. I didn't write this stuff. This God stuff. He wrote this stuff. So you're wandering around on the earth, misdirected, misguided. And there are people who God had intended for you to connect with, to build a life with, to engage with, to, to establish eternal destinies, to influence generational options and build legacies and create wealth and do all of this stuff. And you won't have access to that stuff because you don't know who you are. The enemy convinces people that there is something else besides male and female. And so here you are out here with all of these X, B, G, Q, all of this stuff behind you. And mind, mind you, if it would work, I, you know, I'm thinking, you know, God, if there, is that way it could work? But it ain't. It's not because it's out of it is not a part of the original design. And so what God is saying, look, I want you to be partakers of my divine nature. I want you to be partakers of the peace of the me. I am. This is God. This is I am. I am is saying, I am this way. I am these thoughts. I am these ideologies. I am this mindset. And he also says, let this mind be in you, which was also what? In Christ Jesus. So if you reject that mind, you don't get access to the scroll, which means now your soul is here on earth trying to make it happen all by itself without the written instructions that were created in the mind of God for you. Okay. They're there and they're there not to tell you what to do, but to invite you to participate with them. Those scrolls are there to invite you to engage with them so that you can take your creative genius and you can take God's mind and his idea. And God says, I don't want you to be a robot. I want to blow on your potential and show you what your possibilities are. And then I want to introduce you to what you can do. And then you can take it from there. You can then. And how do we know this works? Because remember when David wanted to build the temple and David, uh, David says, you know, uh, the, uh, the, he says, I'm living in a, I'm living living in a palace. He said in the, in the house of God is still in the tent. And God tells David, God said, uh, Nathan, the prophet tells David to go and do all that's in your heart. And so it was in the heart of David to build the temple. And so God is saying, God did not tell David how to build the temple. God told David, God told David, 
No, your son is going to build the temple. But you know who really built the temple? David did. You know why? Because scripture says it was in the heart of David to build the temple. It wasn't in the heart of Solomon to build the temple. And the reason we know what the temple was going to look like is David saw what the temple should look like because David got all the materials that Solomon needed. David had prepared all of those materials before Solomon ever started. David had made sure that the, the forest of Lebanon had been planted so that there would be the, the trees that would build the temple. He made sure that the rock quarries he had found, David had gotten all of this stuff together. And so when Solomon stepped in, Solomon manifested the image that David saw. Because the only way Solomon could build the temple with the materials that David controlled. So the one who build, who gets the materials determines the structure of the house. So if I got, if I'm building a house and I go out and I buy bricks and the contractor comes in, he's going to build a house with the bricks that I got. If I go out and I get lumber, he's going to build a house with the lumber that I got. So we understand that David was able to get an inner image of what the temple looked like. And that was his privilege, his honor from God. God a lot. God said, well, no, you can't build it. But God did not say you can't get the materials for it. God did not say you can't, you can't, uh, get, you can't have a visual blueprint. We know he had a visual blueprint because the only way you can man know what materials to get is you got to have a visual blueprint in your mind. And so that is our invitation from God to partner with what's on our scrolls so that we can manifest what should be. And we partake of his divine nature. Now I want to close out on talking about the divine nature of God and how the divine nature influences what happens in the soul. Remember, Remember, soul ties, that's the lower level, which are born typically in the flesh, soul ties, um, are, are influenced by one of two entities. They're influenced by the heart and the mind of God, or they're influenced by the demonic realm. And so what the enemy does is he tries to get us, you know, go have sex with as many people as you want, because every time you connect with that person, a piece of your soul is attached to them. It's like, so you see, uh, I, I love this example that I saw once. It's like, this is your soul. And so every time you have sex with somebody and you're sleeping around, a piece of your soul is torn off. And so you got, so now you got this and then, you know, and to the extent that there is a a mental uh, mind attachment, emotional attachment, and will attachment. So your mind is attached. So to the extent and the depth of that attachment determines how much of your soul comes off. So if it's a deep attachment and you are in love with that man, and oh my God, it will it can tear you apart, tear your soul apart. If it's just a light attachment, then just a little piece comes off. But rest assured, every time you connect at a physical level, something of you goes away. And this is not just between men and women. This is between friends, okay? This is between friends. This, this, could be, this could be your best buddy. This could be a friend that you love that you hadn't talked to in five or six years. There's a piece of your soul. And so what re the reason this is so important is God is relational. And he's like, I want you to build strong relationships and have good, positive, healthy connections. Because as you build those and those relationships are formed together, as they intertwine, as they, inter the, as they fold over into each other, they become, well, this is when the Bible says that a, a threefold cord cannot easily be broken. That's like this piece of paper being folded over three times. I can't tear that apart. I can't tear it. I can't tear it. Why? Because it is tight, it is intense, and it is thick. And so this, these kind of ties, God is saying, I want you to understand that that's what it's like when Jesus and I are connected. That's why when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, he says, I want you to be one, even as I and the Father are one. So now you understand that you have scroll ties, S-C-R-O-L-L, -L, and you have soul ties, S-O-U-L. Your soul ties, we've heard about it. People, you know, don't girl don't be having sex with all them people because you're going to be tied up to them. You need to, you need to break them soul ties. And there are, you can break soul ties, but you can't break a scroll tie. Because a scroll tie originated in the mind of God when he thought of you according to Jeremiah 29, 11, and he platted you, that's your Spirit, he took your spirit out of himself and gave your spirit a, a soul and then placed your spirit, your soul inside a body. 
That scroll was written before you ever landed in that body, before your soul was ever assigned to your spirit. And we have to engage with that. We, we get to. We get to. God gives us permission. And there are some people who are assigned to your life. I gave you an example. I gave you the example of Ruth and Naomi. And Ruth says, entreat me not to leave you. She said, don't tell me to leave you. I'm not going anywhere. Don't, or, nor to return from following after you. He said, well, she says, wherever you're going, I'm going. I'm going to be with you. Another example of a tie like that is Elisha and Elisha. Where Elisha tells Elijah, look, if you're here, if you are here, when you, when I, when I'm taken up, then the mantle that I have carried is going to fall into your hand. That cloak that I, that I have worn, that is symbolic of the anointing that was upon me is going to fall to you. But you have to be here when you, when I, if you're there, if you're here, when God takes me. And so what he was saying is there is a soul tie. There is a commitment to the soul and the scroll. And so a person has to, has to decide in every relationship, particularly. And so this is a word for people who have strong relationships, whether it's an ex-husband, whether it's a boyfriend, whether it's a best friend, whether it's a buddy that you love and you guys had a, a falling away, but they're in your heart and you can't, you can't, you, 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 you're still thinking about them. These are best friends. Those could be scroll ties that you need to get with God and say, God, does this person have a significance in my life that pre-existed my, um, my, my, uh, my arrival in this earth? I have several very strong scroll ties. I can tell you one of my best friends, her name is Jackie Goucher. I love that girl. Jackie, Jackie's role in my life, an engagement that I had not known. She opened up insight into worship and teaching that allowed me to access my assignment in the kingdom of God in worship unlike any other person that I had ever known and so that her role in my life allowed me to function in many ways as I do today the things that I learned in in the studios in in, in Southern California years ago singing in studios and doing background and and all of that it opened up that whole level of insight and knowledge it taught me that I had skills from God that I wasn't even aware of. And it was because, and I love her. I, I, I love her. I love, in fact, we got a, we got a weekend coming. I love that girl. I love her. And, and you know, our, we, we laughed because we were saying the other day, we're going to be old ladies sitting on the front porch somewhere. The Lord delay his coming, talking about our lives when we were younger, because we just have that life. You can't, you, and, and as she says, you can't make old friends. You can't take a new friend and make them an old friend. No, if it's an old friend, they're there. They've been there from back then. So, scroll ties and soul ties. Scroll ties pre-existed your soul and your body. They, your scroll ties came out of the mind of God. And in Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, I know the thoughts that I think for you. That word think, one of the meanings is to plait and to intertwine. And so it is an invitation where God says, I'm going to give you a spirit he, say, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my spirit, a piece of myself. I'm going to give it a soul, which is a mind, a will, and an emotion. And then I'm going to place the spirit, the soul in a body and put you in the earth because you require, your body is your earth suit. And there are some things that, you're, that you, to function in this earth, you have to have a body. Okay. And then God says, now, now, once you get there, there are people who are attached to you in order for you to fulfill some things that I need to, that I need done in the earth. And we see examples of that. We see an example of that with Naomi and Ruth. We see another example of that with David and Jonathan. We see another example of that with Paul and Silas. So you see the overlapping of scrolls with people who had divine destinies that required the participation, the agreement, and the partaking of God's divine nature. So they had to come into agreement in the soul realm by allowing the nature of God to supersede any decisions about how they were going to manage each other. And so what does that look like? That means they choose love over anger. They choose relationship over division. They choose the divine nature. What is the divine nature? Now, that's a, this is a whole nother teaching. I might do this later on. But when we talk about the divine nature, it is, well, actually, it's quite, actually, it's a little easier than that. When you look at the fruit of the spirit, 
The fruit of the Spirit is an outline of God's divine nature, and it is an invitation for us to take part of those elements, those nine characteristics, and to introduce them and to weave them into the context of our soulish relationships so that we can be in harmony and agreement and we can do what Jesus says. He's, Jesus says that I and the Father are one and that's his invitation. So when you take my divine nature, which is modeled out in the fruit of the spirit, when you take that and make that your model for being, and you put the needs of the other person, what's best for them in the forefront, and you walk with that as, as God, that's how man can love a woman like Christ loved the church. God, you know, Jesus knows what's best. And that person, that man, if he really loves her, he's gonna do what's best for her. He's gonna protect her soul. He's gonna protect her body. He's not going to violate her. He's going to truly love her. It's going to become a model in the earth. And that's why Satan hates marriage so much. Because he knows that if he can get the scroll, which when two people get married, the two shall become one flesh. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. When those two people come together into one scroll, now they have the potential to become one flesh by becoming one one soul. What is one soul? Bringing into agreement the mind, what they think, the will, what they do, and the emotions, what they feel. Synchronizing those as a couple, as a pair. I am out of time. Man, this was good. I don't know about you, but this was good. I love this. Was this? I'm telling you, this is straight. This is fresh manner. I've never heard anybody teach this, I, but I thank God for sharing it with me. Well, I want to say thank you guys for uh, for hopping on today. This message will be inside the Kyle Circle. It will only be on Facebook for 30 days, and then there, that most of our content is now going into our mighty network in the Kyle Circle. If you are not a member of the Kyle Circle, in addition to the this message, but the notes that I use to teach from today, the scriptures and all of that, all of that's going to be inside the Kyle circle. I want to say thanks to Pam for, um, for, um, for putting those scriptures in there. You guys, make sure you go back and watch this one again because this is some good, this is some, this is some good meat to chew on. Well, I love you, love you, love you. And you guys know what I always say. Till next time, you make it a terrific day. Bye-bye.